Welcome back to our double episode on Egypt's 1977 Bread Intifada, in which we speak to journalist and revolutionary socialist Hossam El Hamalawi. If you haven't listened to part one yet, it's probably best you go back and listen to that first, as it goes through the struggles which set the stage for what we talk about in this episode. <laughs> When we left off in the previous episode, Egyptian President Anwar Sadat had begun introducing his infetech or open door policy of neoliberal reforms against the backdrop of growing political and social unrest. These reforms and opposition to them would come to a head in January 1977. When January 1977 arrived, it was time for the government to declare its new financial budget. And everyone was expecting the so-called flow of wealth from the West, you know, I mean, to flood the country, as Sadat was promising them. Instead, on the night of the 17th uh, of January, the government decided to, by shock therapy, as Sadat called it, uh, to shock the public into lifting all the subsidies uh, or most of the subsidies from the basic commodities that the Egyptian people were dependent on. In Egypt, you know, we call bread Aish, and Aish is also Arabic for living. And this just tells you how much important is this item in the food basket of, of Egyptians. So the government shocked the public into announcing that, you know, they are lifting the subsidies and they were doing away with all the subsidies and the prices of bread and the basic commodities that Egyptians were dependent on increased by more than 100%. So the reaction came immediately. Few protests started on the night of the 17th in the working class neighborhoods in, uh, in Cairo. But on the following day, the entire country went on strike, not organized by any political group or by any trade unions. The people took to the streets, students, workers, all sectors of society that was oppressed by the state took to the streets. They were um, uh, confronted by the central security forces who opened live ammunition, but still could not repress the revolt. And in, in scenes, that were more or less repeated decades later on the Friday of Anger, the 28th of January 2011, which was the third day of the Egyptian revolution, the police disappeared from Cairo. They, they were so smashed that, you know, the central security forces, you know, basically just fled. The people were chanting social slogans uh, related to their uh, living conditions. They were chanting political slogans against the regime. Uh, They were chanting against dictatorship. They were demanding political freedoms. They were chanting against the central security forces and demanding that it would be dissolved. The entire country erupted. It reached the extent that Joseph Tito, who was the leader of Yugoslavia at the time, he was scheduled to meet Sadat in Aswan, he canceled his trip. He didn't have, he, he wouldn't dare like, you know, uh, uh, travel to the country. And Sadat himself was in Aswan at the time. Aswan is a historical touristic city in the south of Egypt. And Sadat was there in one of his many bazillion, bazillion uh, rest houses and palaces uh, waiting for Joseph Tito. And Sadat saw the banners, the official banners that were put up by the government to welcome Tito and to welcome Sadat and all of these, like, you know, uh, arches of victory, they were all burned down by protesters. And his military plane was ready to take off, to take him outside the country and flee out of Egypt, especially that he, he begged the Egyptian army to go and to repress the revolt in the streets. And the Minister of Defense was so scared about sending in the army unless mutinies would happen from the conscripts. And it was only after Sadat promised the Minister of Defense that he would scrap off 
those uh, neoliberal decrees that the army finally agreed to send in its special forces, not even the regular forces. They sent in the mechanized uh, special forces and the so-called Thunderbolt uh, troops, the Saka troops. These are like, you know, our Green Berets, you know, or like, you know, the, the special forces in the Egyptian army who are like, you know, relatively more trained and relatively higher paid. So their loyalty, you know, would not be questioned as much as the conscripts if they get sent in to repress uh, the protests. Like in many armies, conscripts in the Egyptian military were, in contrast to their middle or upper class officers, usually from working class or peasant backgrounds, young men who had been taken from their families for three years. As such, in the face of mass working class revolt, the loyalty of the conscripts could not be assured, causing a huge problem for the Sadat regime. Sadat almost collapsing in a nervous breakdown and preparing to leave the country by a military plane destroys the entire taboo and entire myth of like, you know, the invincible pharaoh that each Egyptian ruler, you know, since the beginning of history has been always trying to portray himself. And it is, it also breaks the taboo that many of the other Egyptian rulers have always claimed that Egyptians are an obedient nation. They always follow the ruler. We built the first pyramids, it, which is a symbol of slavery because we worshipped, you know, I mean, our own rulers who we thought that they were gods and blah, blah, blah. And Egyptians will never revolt, you know, I mean, against uh, authority. Egyptians are a very docile, you know, I mean, nations. This is the kind of shit I used to hear when I was in the 1990s as a student activist. And not just from, like, you know, uh, foreign Orientalists, you know, from the West. It, it's from Egyptians, you know, because you, you self-internalize all of these negative ideas, you know, I mean, about yourself. Because it's easier to internalize them than to take the risk, you know, to confront authority. In response to Sadat's lifting of subsidies, there was a huge wave of wildcat strikes throughout Egypt. In Herwan, by 9am, thousands of workers had walked out and were demonstrating through the district, quickly being joined by workers from other factories. At the same time, workers were striking in Shubra el Khaimah, with some workplaces being occupied. Meanwhile, in Alexandria, workers from the naval arsenal walked out and were joined by workers from other factories before marching to the university district where they were joined by thousands of students. Scenes like this were playing out all over the country. The events started, as I said, by scattered protests on the night of the 17th of January. And they were all wildcat protests here and there. They were not organized by any political group. But comes the morning and the entire country is on strike. Was it called for by any trade union? Actually, no. Because in Egypt, we did not have independent trade unions per se. This was because Nasser had smashed the independent labor movement when he came to power. Hossam goes into this in a little more detail in our bonus episode. So when 1977 came, that, that structure of course, did not step in and support the Egyptian workers. On the contrary, the Egyptian workers were striking and were mobilizing and were demonstrating despite the disapproval of their union officials at the time. So these protests that started in the morning, they were on the campuses and on all the Egyptian campuses at the time, but also in Shobra al which is this district north of Cairo, where there is uh, the textile mills, in Shobra al in Hilwan, which we spoke about earlier, in Ghazl al-Mahalla, in the Nile Delta provinces, in Alexandria, literally all the urban centers, the protests during these two days were largely spontaneous. But in anything that is spontaneous, even when people act spontaneously, I mean, they act based on what they were doing in the previous years. So in 1977, there isn't a trade union leader or trade union leaders who came out and issued 
you know, I mean, a general directive, for example, to their base cadres, now take to the streets and do a strike. There wasn't a unified student body, although students were still relatively much more independent and much more organized than the workers at the time, that basically could have mobilized the entire students just like that in a single direction or to tell them what to do or what not to do. It was a spontaneous uprising. But again, I mean, it was the same students who marched on the parliament a year before. They were the same students who were organizing in solidarity with the Hilwan and the Mahalla workers in 1975. They were the same students who were organizing in solidarity with the Cairo public transport strikers in 1976. So anything that they were doing during the uprising, even when it is spontaneous, it was also based on their organizing experience. Protests continued throughout January 18th. By the evening, demonstrators were expressing their anger towards the regime with strategic acts of sabotage and destruction. Numerous headquarters of the Arab Socialist Union were burnt down, luxury hotels, casinos and nightclubs were looted and destroyed, and railway lines were blocked using burning tyres and broken streetlights. Police stations were also attacked, with demonstrators in sewers even managing to seize arms and ammunition. So the workers uh, took to the streets... I mean, initially they occupied their factories, but then they flooded, you know, I mean, to the streets. And that's when the looting and the attacks uh, against property started, which Sadat later tried to portray the events as just some crazy mob rioting that was aimed at looting public and private property. However, if you look at the performance of the different groups. The students were not part of the destruction and the sabotage that happened. The industrial workers were not part of the sabotage and the attacks. Actually, workers protected their own factories and they controlled it briefly for these two days. And when they took to the streets, there were even like some scenes that were documented later about uh, the protests, the protesters gently moving the vegetable carts that belonged to the street vendors so that, you know, so as to make way, they did not attack any private or public property. They did not attack or set fire to any buildings. But most of those who carried out the looting and the attacks were the urban poor. But it wasn't crazy violence. It wasn't misguided violence at the end of the day. People do not attack targets that are random. They attack the symbols of oppression. So yes, if the urban poor, they go and they attack and they storm police stations, it's for very obvious reasons. You know, these are torture factories. The urban poor and the protesters, they did throw rocks at at public buses and at public trains. This might puzzle a little bit, you know, I mean, your listeners or or some people. But if you see pictures of those public buses and public trains, especially in the 1970s, these are not uh, human public transportation means. This is where the Egyptian citizen is humiliated on a daily basis by riding in a sardine tin, as we call it in Egypt where you find people on top of one another. And in the Egyptian pop culture and in movies and in songs, you always find references, you know, to how, like, on a daily basis, the Egyptian is humiliated in the means of the public transport. So when people attack the public buses, they were attacking the the machines where they are uh, humiliated and tortured on a daily basis, basically. That's how they viewed it. They attacked government buildings, obviously, because this is a symbol of authority. They attacked the nightclubs, you know, because the nightclubs, that's where the filthy rich Egyptians, you know, used to go and party and get drunk and do this and do that and live a lifestyle which the average Egyptian can never afford in a lifetime. You know, there were uh, some funny photos, actually, at the time of veiled urban poor women, you know, like strong Egyptian women, like coming out of the nightclubs, carrying bottles of liqueur, you know, from the nightclubs. 
it's not like they would get drunk, but you know, everyone was like looting everything that they can put their hands on that the elites, you know, I mean, were doing. So there was violence indeed, uh, and some looting and some destruction during these two days, but the violence was not random. It was limited and confined to the symbols of wealth and oppression and tyranny. One of the Egyptian bourgeois intellectual who was like walking on the second day of the uprising, and instead of seeing those events as a form of resistance and as, as having potential for developing into a real chance for liberation socially and politically, he was like looking with all sadness at those barefooted urban poor kids who were throwing rocks at buses and at public property and private property, and they were part of the looting and the destruction. And that intellectual, he asked one of the kids, why are you destroying your country? And the kid replied back, it's not my country, it's theirs. This just sums it up. This kid destroyed the whole nationalist logic, the whole patriotic bullshit. This kid is much more intellectual than this miserable self-described intellectual who was like, you know, I mean, all weeping about, you know, the burning of the country and destruction of the country. Yes, people are alienated. These five-star hotels and five-star nightclubs, it's theirs. It's not mine. These like fancy uh, shops that were selling like Western brands that you can find in Paris and New York and elsewhere which, you know, very tiny group of Egyptians could afford. This is theirs, not ours. So it is this story of this urban poor kid, which I came across in one of the very few sources that documented the events, and which I mentioned in, in more details in my research. It always like sticks out, and I always remember it, because you will always find parallels, you know, I mean, to it everywhere. So... That urban poor kid in Cairo in 1977, I am sure that you will find that his brother, you know, in the London riots in 2011, in, in Tahrir Square, you know, in January 28th, 2011, you will find him in every single revolution. And it's, it's this kid that we have to learn from. As mentioned earlier, as well as walking out on wildcat strike, many Egyptian workers also occupied their factories. In some cases, these occupations shut down production. In others, they restarted production, but without their managers. However, as Hossam explains, these occupations still took place within the limits of Nasserist political horizons. These factory occupations, and when workers were running their factories, I mean, these were experiments that did not last for long. And they were affiliated, or they were part of industrial actions that would last for a few days before they are crushed right away by the state's forces. But literally, in every single factory that witnessed industrial actions, workers, uh, w whether it's in Helwan, whether it's in Mahalla, whether it's in Mansoura, whether it is in Shobr al Khaima, in Alexandria, in Cairo, the workers would occupy the factory, shut it down, uh, on themselves, barricade themselves inside so that the central security forces would not storm uh, the factory. But then here is the, the interesting thing. They would continue with the production and they would be the ones supervising it. Now, maybe uh, socialists like you and I, we would see the seeds for the socialist society that we want in the future, you know, in, in these actions. Uh, from below, but we also have to be accurate and realistic about the limitations of the Egyptian industrial actions at the time. The ideology of Nasserism and the ideology of populist nationalism did not lose its sexiness at the time. I mean, even when people got disillusioned by Nasser after 1967, it wasn't a complete disillusionment. And actually, with the uh, neoliberal transition under Sadat that started in 1974, many of the Egyptian workers, including the strike leaders, they felt nostalgic 
to the Nasser days, where even, you know, with the repression, but the public sector was a steady, secure job where you got a contract, where you got health insurance, where you got housing, where you got all sorts of rights that, you know, it's it's not a perfect world. It's definitely far below what we want as socialists, but compared to the neoliberal reforms that happened later, it was a paradise, of course. So part of why workers continued with the production during these occupations were not necessarily because they believed that they were building, let's say, workers' councils, or they were building an alternative society. They regarded the public sector company as a socialist enterprise. And they regarded the the factory as something that belongs to the people. So if we strike, this means that we will be hurting our own people. This was one of the contradictions in the consciousness of the Egyptian industrial action movement that continued, by the way, all the way till the 1990s. And when workers confront the state, their biggest weapon or their most effective weapon is strike. So we have to be a little bit realistic about these occupations at the time, as much as this is definitely a step forward. I mean, any form of organized industrial actions always gives you a potential for developing these industrial actions into something much more militant in the future. So I'm not, I'm not trying to denounce that. But at the same time, it did have limitations related to the ideology of the uh, industrial strike leaders. They were populists. And the radical communists who existed among them were Stalinist in the end. So the kind of communism that they were also preaching and, and calling for was more or less a radical version of Nasserism. Communists and, and Nasserists were in the same bed most of the time. It even reached the extent that, you know, the ones who were doing the political education in the Arab Socialist Union under Nasser, who were like educating the masses, quote unquote, into Arab socialism, they were all ex-communists who used to lead the Egyptian Communist Party. But for them, Arab socialism was not really different from what they were preaching. So the kind of policies that they were advocating was mainly like a return to what Nasser was doing a decade earlier, which might be a little bit more progressive, maybe, than the neoliberal reforms that was being presented at the time. But it is a state capitalist project where those factories, at the end of the day, are run by state bureaucrats, where workers would have representation in the management, but it's symbolic representation. It's bullshit. So these factory occupations were happening on a regular basis from 1975 till the uprising in 1977. And workers would take control uh, of the factories. They would kick out the management uh, from the factories. And they would continue with the production until the central security forces come in and they would smash them. Like in many places around the world during the post-1968 cycle of struggles, Egyptian students were heavily involved in the 1977 uprising, attempting to build links with workers and other sections of society, as they had done in previous years. Oh, of course. The protesters, the student protesters, were chanting the famous slogan, uh, We are the students with the workers against the capitalist state. And there were all sorts of chants that the students were chanting to try also to win over the conscripts of the central security forces during the the first day of the uprising before they were completely smashed. So there were beep chants like the conscript is oppressed in the army and it doesn't eat bread and they wear rags. But of course, I mean, I'm translating those chants, you know, but in Arabic, they rhyme more beautifully, (laughs) I can assure you. And in Egypt, and I guess like Britain and elsewhere, you know, we have a strong like football culture. And when people take to the streets, they chant 
the same football chants, but then they start changing them and modifying them into like, you know, I mean, the political targets. So instead of chanting against like the fans of your adversary, you know, in the football field, you're actually chanting against the police, your adversaries in the government and elsewhere. So from the start, because these neoliberal decrees, it hit hard everyone. I'm talking here everyone like middle class and below. And most of those students, they came from those backgrounds. Remember that the industrialization that Nasser embarked on during his reign, it expanded not just the Egyptian working class, but it also expanded the Egyptian student community. So yes, the students and the workers, they fraternized from the start of the events. As can be imagined, the media response to the uprising was unsurprisingly negative, blaming communists both in Egypt and abroad for the revolt. When the 1977 events happened, the media went ballistic, Sadat went ballistic. He started accusing the communists of orchestrating those events. The media dubbed it as conspiracy run by communists who are puppets for the Libyans, who are puppets for the Soviets, who are puppets for like, you know, every single country you can imagine on the face of this earth. But they can't be like true Egyptians because true Egyptians can never rebel against their own beloved leader and destroy their own country like what they did. If you go back to the newspapers at the time and you check the headlines, it would be all in red and it would be like accusing the communists of setting Egypt on fire. And actually, when I talk to veteran communists uh, at the time, they would tell you that the government gave us so much credit for the events that we wish if we were the ones that instigated it and led it. For example, a, a veteran communist I know, he told me that he was asleep at his house and he woke up when the protesters were in the streets like chanting. And he like, you know, what I mean, he woke up from sleep not knowing what was happening. A few minutes later, he got detained. Other communist leaders were, for example, at the time, they were conscripted in the army. So they could not have taken part, you know, I mean, in the protests. Others were like, oh, my God, what's happening? You know, they, they have been calling for a revolution for a very long time. And when it finally happened, they were like taken by surprise and they were totally unprepared. Because going back again to the problems of Stalinism in Egypt, while Stalinists under Nasser and before Nasser were always putting the national question, you know, and let's let's postpone talking about socialism until we get our uh, uh, liberation from the Brits. Let's uh, postpone, you know, talking about working class actions. It's time now to build Egypt with the help of Nasser and blah, blah, blah. So there isn't any communist organization, for example, that raised the slogan down with Sadat during 1977. That's like the hilarious thing. You know, you had your own uprising and not a single organization put forward, you know, the slogan down with Sadat. The ceiling for demands for all of them was uh, scrapping off the new liberal decrees. They failed to grasp, you know, I mean, the moment. While the uprising was successful in forcing Sadat to back down on his neoliberal reforms, the fact that it didn't continue to push for wider social or political concessions from the regime, or even to topple the regime itself, meant that the Egyptian state was given space for its counterattack. The uprising took place on the 18th of January, the 19th of January, by the 19th of January, I mean, the police had already been completely smashed in, in Cairo, at least, which is the capital. And Sadat had to U-turn and to back down and to scrap off the new liberal decrees so as to appease the masses. And then he sent in the army, which largely were the special forces and the mechanized infantry, in order to crush whatever protests were still happening. So by the third day, the uprising was already losing steam until it was completely crushed after three days. And this was followed, of course, with a, with a state on slot. When uprisings fail, you don't go back to square one. You actually face much, much, much worse situations. So the government said that in... It, like decreed several laws that uh, stifled dissent. 
he decreed a law in 1979 that basically did away with the independence of the student unions. Uh, he purged the civil service from any leftist elements, and he threw himself more and more within the camp of the U.S. and the Arab Gulf countries, seeking their financial support in order to try to come out of the crisis that he's in. He increased his anti-communist propaganda to a great extent. And moreover, you cannot really separate his obsession with trying to reach a settlement with Israel from all of this. At the end of the day, you know, it was uh, his infamous trip to Israel. I mean, came within the same year as the uprising. You know, it was after the uprising because he was like desperate. You know, he needs help from anyone uh, at the end of the day. The infamous trip to Israel, which Hossam mentions, is Sadat's official visit to Israel in November 1977, the first of its kind by any Arab leader and one which was deeply unpopular throughout the Arab world. In fact, it would also be one of the factors motivating his assassination by members of Islamic Jihad four years later. Back in 1977, however, the inability of the bread intifada to push beyond simply repealing the unpopular neoliberal decrees signaled the end of the high watermark in Egyptian radical politics. So, more or less, this signaled not just the end of the uprising, it also signaled the end of that leftist uh, wave. The history of, of the left in Egypt is divided into waves. So the first wave, usually we refer to it from 1918 to 1924. The second wave, which was the strongest uh, communist wave we had in Egypt, was from the late 1930s all the way till 1964, when our genius uh, communist leaders went and they dissolved their own party to join Nasser. And then the third wave was from 1968. And historians usually would refer or like would mark its end by the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 1990, which is true, but in effect, it was clinically dead after 1977. Because you had your chance for a revolution and you failed. And the Egyptian people are not stupid. They are not going to follow the leftists, you know, if the leftists are not delivering. So they followed you for an entire decade and you did not deliver. So you cannot also separate the rise of Islamism, you know, I mean, later. You, you cannot separate it from the failure of the left. There isn't something intrinsically religious about Middle Eastern people. You know, that's very racist and orientalist way, you know, I mean, to think of. The, that same Egyptian people, for two decades, they gave their support for secular forces, which failed them at every single event. They supported the Arab nationalists, and they got us defeated in 1967. They supported the communists, and they did absolutely nothing except trying to opportunistically further themselves and self-promote and do self-promotion with elements of the regime. And when it was uh, an uprising time in 1977, they did not do anything. They failed. So, of course, people had to start looking for other alternatives. So they gave their support for the Islamists for the next two decades. So this is really the tragic end of 1977 and the third communist wave in Egypt. But at the same time, as socialists, we understand that we are part of a long tradition. We are part of a long tradition of victories and defeats. And we have to learn our own history quite well and come up, you know, I mean, with lessons learned from it because revolutions are inevitable. The victory of the revolutions are not inevitable. You know, revolutions, they can either be victorious or they can get defeated. But with the nature of capitalism, capitalism is bound to always get into cyclical economic crises. And when these economic crises happen, the regimes and the ruling classes, they start attacking the social gains of the exploited classes in society. And this is bound to trigger 
forms of resistance that may differ from one country to the other or from one epoch to the other. Now, will these resistance movements manage to deliver? This is not inevitable. If we are organized well enough before these revolutions break out, we will be able to help and be part of that event and to be a force that at least pushes it forward and not backward, like what the Stalinists uh, in Egypt did. Though lasting only a few days, the 1977 uprising marked the high point of Egypt's post-1968 struggles. As Hossam points out, however, those struggles were inseparable from the broader post-1968 rebellions, both within the region and globally. The revolt was crushed after two days, and uh, roughly more than 70 people were killed, uh, hundreds were injured. But again, was this revolt happening out of the blue? No. It was preceded by an entire decade of struggles. Did that uprising happen within a regional and global vacuum? No. If you look at the rest of the region at the time, which is also very reminiscent of what happened later in the Arab Spring, Tunisia had a two-day workers' national uprising in January 1978. Iran had its revolution in 1978-79. In the rest of the region, there were all like protests and social upheavals that were happening around the same time. And in my humble view, you cannot separate the Egyptian 1977 from those regional uprising, and you cannot separate them from the defeat of the Americans in Vietnam in 1975, from the Portuguese revolution in 1974, from the collapse of fascism in Spain in 1975, from what was happening in the rest of the world. The entire world was already on fire from 1968 all the way till the late 70s. Workers and students from 1968 all the way to 1977 were going on their also uh, mass strikes and dissent was growing. This was happening everywhere. That's the end of our double episode on the 1977 Bread Intifada. We also have a bonus episode where Hossam talks about the attitudes of Islamist groups and religious authorities to the uprising, as well as more detail on the repression faced by the Egyptian labour movement during the Nasi years. So if you want to listen to that, plus get various discounts on books and merch, then join us on patreon.com slash workingclasshistory. And obviously, if you can't spare any money, then you can help spread working class history by sharing our work and giving us a five star review on your favorite podcast apps. If you want to learn more about the Bread Intifada and post 1968 radical politics in Egypt, then you should check out Hossam's master's thesis. See the link in the show notes. You'll also find links to his website and his entire photography archive from 2003 to the present, where all his photos are available under Creative Commons. And if you want to support his work, you can leave him a tip via his PayPal as well. The theme music for this episode is Build Your Palaces by radical Egyptian songwriter Sheikh Imam. Links to stream and download in the show notes. And finally, thanks to all our patrons for making this show possible. And a special thank you to Connor Kanatsi, Shay, James, Ariel Joya and Stone Lawson. We wouldn't be able to make these shows without the support that all of you give us. Anyway, that's all we've got time for for today. Hope you enjoyed the episodes and thanks for listening.